So good evening or good morning, depending on where you may be joining us from, but thank you all for joining us um, for the conclusion and keynote for the Student Leadership Institute here at Georgia Southern University. Uh, this has become an international affair as we have students and uh, professionals joining us from all over this evening. Uh, my name is John Banter and I'll be the moderator for this talk. If you have any questions for the presenter, we'll be using the Q&A feature and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but you can submit your questions at any time. Please note that any behavior that disrupts from this presentation will lead to removal from the session. And we may, if you are a Georgia Southern student, refer you to student conduct. So lastly, if you are joining us, I know some Georgia Southern students may be joining us for wings incentive points uh, for your student organization. You must stay for the entirety of the session. To introduce our speaker, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Maria Wajardo. Uh, she has been somebody that over this year I have come to treasure for wisdom uh, as we have a group of professionals that gather together and has kind of been the redeeming quality of 2020. But she is committed to raising the next generation of global leaders as a professor of leadership studies at Soka University in Tokyo. Previously, she served as a dean and vice president with the distinction of being the first non-Japanese female to serve in those positions. Her research connects leadership development, global citizenship, education, and social change. Her work in diversity, equity, and inclusion has taken her from Malaysia to Mumbai and from Singapore to South Africa. Her portfolio includes national and local policy work, leading national youth development initiatives, and advancing educational initiatives for children living in poverty. Maria is a clinical psychologist and has degrees from Harvard University and the University of Denver. I will now turn the talk over to Dr. Wajardo. Thank you so much, John, and it is a pleasure to be here uh, with friends, with students, with colleagues. And in Tokyo, it is eight in the morning, so I will say good morning, but also good evening. So I am looking forward to interacting with you. I'm looking forward to knowing who you are. We are a community for the next hour. And so I love, one aspect that I love about Zoom is the chat box. I'm going to have you go into the chat box right now because leadership is not a spectator sport. It is participatory. And what I want you to do is just type in one or two words that come to mind when you think of leadership. Just one or two words, not paragraphs, not set, just one or two words. When you think or you hear the word leadership, what comes to mind? Service, absolutely. Morgan, service, role model. Thank you for that, Ellie. Jaslyn, hardworking, influence, humble and excited. Great, great descriptors. Perseverance, being part of a community. Being a trailblazer, I love that one. I love them all, but these are all very descriptive. So as we look at that list, and if I were to sit down to type my list for you, I would say leadership is personal. Leadership is personal. Leadership is about connecting to power and influence. And leadership is about relationships. So thank you so much for all of those descriptors. I think we could put all those together and form the most fabulous uh, definition uh, and description of leadership. So leadership for social change. My definition of leadership for social change is leadership is about the practice of influencing others in order to contribute to the common good. So the practice of influencing others in order to contribute to the greater good. And so this, um, for this hour, what I'd like to do is share with you three questions, three questions that will guide us in anchoring and, and, and connecting to this concept of leadership for social change. And let me just share the three questions. I'll keep repeating them. So you're going to hear them. You'll be familiar with them by the end of the hour. The first question, who am I? Who am I? The second question, why do I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? And then the third question, what would I attempt to do if I knew I could not fail? What would I attempt to do if I knew I could not fail? So leadership for social change 
connected to these three questions really begin to push us forward into a leadership renaissance. And that's what I want us to, to grapple with and connect to during this hour. Now, the second part of the title for this talk was from a Latina perspective. So you may be wondering, well, what does Maria have to offer uh, from a Latina perspective? So in order to answer that, let me share with you what I will not offer. I will not be giving you a checklist of Latino leadership. It's not that simple. So just sort of erase that expectation out of your mind. There is no checklist for Latino leadership. What will I not be doing? I will not be offering politically correct terms for what to call me, for how to identify each other. That's not what I'm going to be doing today. Not that it's not important, but it's not what I'm going to be doing. And thirdly, I will not be giving you a description of how all Latinos think and behave because we are not monolithic. And if we wanted to bring that point home, just think back to last week in the election. With the election results out and continuing to emerge, Latino votes have been unpacked. We're starting to examine how did Latinos vote? That's a very big question in the electorate. I would suggest to you that the results are beginning to show both diversity and unity. Where is the diversity in, Lat in the Latino vote or the Latino voice? If we look at the state of Florida and we begin to unpack how the Latino community voted, what we'll see is that Cubans and Cuban Americans by and large tended towards the, uh, a vote for the seated president for Trump. Mexican Americans and other Latinos from Central and South America tended towards a Biden vote. So there was diversity there even within the Latino community. That's just one state. If we were to look at this nationally, what we also begin to um, uncover is that younger, more educated Latinos weigh heavily or more heavily on the Democrat side than on the Republican side. So there's diversity as well as unity as we begin to look at who is this Latino community. So let's talk about what will it take to continue to expand this leadership renaissance that we are experiencing. So let's take that first question. Who am I? What informs my practice of leadership? I would suggest to you that we need to consider the cultural context. Culture matters. Culture matters when we're looking at leadership. The traditional field of leadership comes from a Western perspective and it began or it, some of its origins are back in at looking at the great man theory of leadership, where it was examining um, examples, role models of great leaders. And interestingly enough, those role models happen to be male and happen to be Western centric, either from the United States, from Europe, the great philosophers. So the question was, well, is that really the, the depth and the breadth of leadership? And what we understand now is that no, that traditional field has continued to expand. And I would suggest to you that your cultural narrative will inform and ground this emerging renaissance of leadership. So in order to know who I am as a leader, you have to be able to, to listen, to experience, to, to sense who I am as a cultural being. So culture, in fact, does matter because it shapes and continues to shape my worldview. So let me share a little bit about who I am. I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrants. My family comes from Mexico, from the state of San Luis Potosí. They crossed the border into the United States uh, during a time when the government in the US was looking for farm workers, for field workers through the Bra Bracero program. So my parents came with three small children in tow, came as, as migrant workers, settled in California and had three more children. I was born in a labor camp. Spanish was my first language. I did not learn English until I began to attend school. First grade, kindergarten are all a blur because I have no memory of those early years. I grew up poor. And the wonderful thing about poverty is that you don't really 
recognize that you're poor until you begin to meet others that perhaps aren't quite so poor. And so there's this bliss and ignorance for a while as a small child, but I began to recognize quickly that I was different. As the daughter of Mexican immigrants growing up in California, I looked at what was being shown on television. I looked at the books at school and in the library, and I never saw anyone that looked like me. So understanding why culture matters connects us to identity. Who and what is connected to your identity? As a little girl, I wanted to be white. I valued being white better than being Mexican because it just seemed like white was better. I remember I had a little friend, Vivian, in kindergarten, and she was Mexican, I was Mexican. She spoke Spanish, I spoke Spanish, but Vivian's skin was very light complected. And as a five-year-old, I asked her one day, Vivian, how did you get so white? And this little girl, my best friend, said to me, in all seriousness, I take baths and milk. And as a little girl, I thought, well, that must be the clue, that the key, that's, that's what must happen. I ran home trying to figure out how I would get enough milk in my bathtub in order to be able to change my skin color. And then I really thought this was possible. So then I wondered, how will I explain this to my parents that I'm turning white? So a short little story, part of my narrative that said, as children growing up in the United States of America or in other countries, we're looking at our identity. We're trying to understand where and how does our culture fit in? Are we visible to others or are we invisible? As a high school student, I was so invisible, no one ever encouraged me to apply to college. And because no one said, don't do it, I applied to Harvard and to Yale and to Brown and to Stanford, imagining that I would never get in. Once I did get in, then the question was, well, why you? I realized that growing up, there was a lot of context of deficit in being Mexican, deficit in being a minority, deficit in being a person of color. And over time, I've, as I've embraced my own identity, I've learned to understand that these descriptors, in fact, are strengths. So if we're going to push forward with leadership for social change, culture matters. What is your cultural narrative? And I appreciate that some individuals say, well, Maria, I don't want to see differences. I don't see color. And while that intention is positive, what I would say to you is that if you don't see color, you don't see me. Because I am a woman of color. I am a woman with a cultural heritage and a cultural narrative that frames my perspective on leadership. And in order to advance together in this leadership renaissance, we will need to be able to not only embrace our cultural narrative, but become very skilled at sharing it with others, making the unfamiliar familiar. And in order to be able to do this, I would suggest that we have to expand our way of thinking about diversity. For too long, we have thought, well, if we can simplify everyone, if we can make everything simple, it would be easier. Maybe that's the approach. And I would suggest to you that that's the opposite of what we need. Our job as leaders is to heighten our level of comfort with the complexity, not to simplify down to bare minimum, but to respect that my differences are actually contributive to the conversation, to the problem solving, to the leadership landscape. And I need to understand your differences in order to be able to form shared goals. So let's heighten our level of comfort with the complexity. So under who I am, who am I? The first part is culture matters. The second part I would suggest to you, another element is community matters. Where are you seen? Where are you made whole? Where do you belong? Leaders, leadership, it's a practice of engagement. It's a practice of connecting to others. And that connection begins in a place where we feel whole. 
I moved to Japan seven years ago. Denver had been home for 30 years. I don't speak Japanese and I knew no one in Western Tokyo, Hachioji, where Soka University is based. When I came, my son was only 15 and he remained behind in the United States to finish his high school years. And so I traveled back and forth often. And when I was leaving Japan, going to the United States, I always said, I'm going home. And then when I found myself returning from the United States to Japan, I'd always say, I'm going to Japan. I never said Japan was home. So the question then became, where is home for me? Where do I feel I belong? Leaders have a responsibility to be able to create that, that level of engagement for the community that they practice in. And so home today, I have a new definition. It's not a geographic place. It's not where I've spent a decade of my life. Home is where I am loved. Home is where the people that I love belong, the people that I care about. So I feel that I can now very honestly and truthfully say, I feel at home in Mumbai. I feel at home in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. If I travel to Brazil, there will be families fighting to have me stay with them because that has become home as well. So as we think about community, our definition of where we are made whole as leaders, our job is to become whole so that we can engage at the most effective level in this practice of leadership. So who am I speaks to our strengths, speaks to our cultural narrative. I often like to say it speaks to my superpowers because as a Latina, and as someone who is owning my identity, I am very cognizant that yes, I speak two languages. I grew up in two different cultures in the United States, my Mexican home culture, and then the American culture at school. I, I often joke that I not only speak two languages, actually I speak four, but I, I can think in multi, multiple languages. I dream in different languages. I remember the first time I, spoke Japanese in my dreams. That's when I began to feel, oh, oh, I think I'm getting settled in this new country, right? So where, what are your superpowers? Let's claim them, let's own them because that's who you are. And that is where your worldview emerges. You are not a blank slate. And although you may not have had much practice yet, naming and sharing your cultural narrative, what I would say to you is that we need your voice. We need your cultural narrative in this new understanding of leadership. So as I think about the diversity that I encounter in my classes, currently I'm teaching a global leadership course. I have 30 students, 14 countries, 17 languages. And when I ask them, what's leadership to you? The perspectives range, just like the perspectives that you shared in the chat at the beginning of our talk. That cultural narrative is precious and unique to you. So we have to be able to name it. So that was the first question, who am I? So let's go on to the second question. Ready? Are you ready? All right, second question. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? The elements in this question that connect to leadership and social change are purpose and voice. What is the purpose of your leadership practice? Why do you show up as a leader, as an emerging leader? Why should anyone follow you? I love that question. Why should anyone follow you? I think individuals follow and want to be connected to that leader is because of purpose. One's purpose is connected to one's passion. So imagine that you had to write a short paragraph, 150 words, why do I do what I do? What is your purpose in practicing leadership and showing up on this planet? Well, that's an actual exercise that the Harvard Business School often 
conducts with their graduate students. It was an exercise that was introduced to me over a dozen years ago. And when I first wrote my paragraph, I sat quiet and I reflected. And as I began to write, I really dug deep and asked myself, why am I doing this work? Why am I a clinical psychologist not doing clinical psychology? What is it that I'm doing? And I wrote, and then the second part of the exercise is that you have to put a headline on your paragraph. Imagine it's a news article. So what would my headline read? That day, my headline read, I do what I do because my parents were illiterate. Coming from Mexico, my parents never went to school properly. My father never went to school. My mother only went as far as second grade. Between the two of them, they've never read a book. They don't know how, they're illiterate. And yet as a child going to school, loving school, I realized that education was opening doors and opportunities for me. And I wanted to create that for others. I wanted to be able to contribute to that opening of access for others. But sometimes we have to connect back to those that are supporting us because they may not be familiar with the dreams and the vision that you have with the purpose that you're discovering. I remember going to college and deciding I was going to major in psychology. And then that I wanted to become a clinical psychologist, not that I had ever met one, I probably needed one, but I, I never really, I just, I just understood that perhaps this was my field. And I remember sharing it with my mother in Spanish that I wanted to, to study to be a psychologist. And she looked at me very thoughtfully and she said, Ay, pero mija, ¿por qué quieres trabajar con los locos? Why do you want to work with crazy people? That was her question. She had no idea what a psychologist did, except that maybe we worked with the mentally ill. And I shared with her that that wasn't exactly my, my focus, but what I wanted to do was gain enough knowledge and expertise and skill so that I could make growing up easier for others. That was my purpose and it continues to be my purpose. Becoming a clinical psychologist, I imagined that my role would be to comfort the distressed. I understand now as, as a professor and as a community activist that my job is not to necessarily comfort the distressed. My role now is to distress the comfortable. My role now as a leader for social change is in fact to promote and advance change, change for the greater good. So, why do you do what you do? Part of it is purpose, and that purpose is connected to your passion. It also begs the question of discovering your voice. Leaders are messengers. Leaders are uniters. Leaders lend their voice for that common vision. So how have you worked to discover your voice? I often say 80% of leadership is showing up. You have to be present. If you're not present, then it's not going to work. It's like being part of a basketball team and then not coming to the playoffs. If you, you have to show up, even if you sit on the bench, you have to show up. And once you show up, the question is, how will you use your voice? For all of you that are in your 20s and your 30s, the social platforms that you have now for lending your voice are tremendous. At your age, I didn't have those. We didn't have the internet. Imagine how old I am. Imagine we didn't have computers. I typed my master's thesis on a typewriter, all right? So, but my son who's 23 years old has always had computers in his environment as many of you have. So where are you lending your voice? And I would suggest to you that leaders not only connect to their purpose, but their intention. And that that is communicated in who you are as that messenger. So lending your voice for those that are voiceless, lending your voice for that minority opinion that needs to be heard. We often lend our voice on social media platforms, but I would suggest to you and challenge you, even during this time of COVID-19, how to share and lend your voice in dialogue with another.
And dialogue is not conversation. Dialogue is not a debate. Dialogue is not an interview. I live by the definition that Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator, posed. And he suggested that dialogue is a process of transformation, where you listen to another human being with, with the purpose of understanding who they are. Not to agree necessarily, but to listen to understand. So in this process of discovering your voice, I would suggest that we also have to become great listeners and to have that intention of listening for understanding. So why do I do what I do? We need to connect to our purpose. We need to connect to our voice. We need to be able to name what is unspoken to make the invisible visible. And for me, social change is about standing for social justice. In order to discover my own voice, I've had to make it a habit to share. So now I'm going to ask you to share. So remember that exercise that I, that I post to you about why do you do what you do and what would be your headline? I want you to go to the chat room right now. Imagine that you are going to write the headline for your news article that explains why you do what you do. A headline has to be short, just a few words, half a sentence. Why do you do what you do? Let's go into the chat room. Share with me. This is your opportunity to practice. Remember, leadership is not a spectator sport. All right. I do what I do for a better future. Sarah Wright, thank you for being the first one. If I were nearby, I'd give you, I'd give you a coffee. I'd give you whatever it is, your favorite drink. Um, why else? Why else? Morgan, to help others and further my knowledge. Absolutely. So why do I do what I do? Kayla says, well, to be able to help and serve others. This is your headline. This is your headline that begins to name and make visible your purpose and your intention. It can be visionary as Presley's is to make the world a better place. Absolutely. I love claims. I may be black, but I'm not another number. Thank you so much. I see you at this moment. I see you Clayton through your voice, through your headline. So let's focus on being able to honor that each one of us in this practice of leadership are doing what we do for a reason. So what is your purpose? What is your passion? Takumi, thank you for joining us to realize the best possibility of humanity. Emily Ramirez, I'm, I do what I do to be able for my parents who have sacrificed everything for me to be here. Absolutely. I stand here before you Yes, I'm a graduate of Harvard. Yes, I have a PhD. You know what? I even have a congressional commendation from the US Congress for my efforts in Latino education. Who would have thought that that little five-year-old who wanted to be white shows up in this capacity, right? Who would have thought? So as we begin to think about our purpose, our passion, we have to be able to connect also to our voice and to be able to share. Ashby, thank you for saying, I do what I do in order to impact others positively with my morals and principles. Your purpose, your headline is yours alone and it changes over time. I did this exercise recently with a group of graduate students and I wrote my own headline. And this time I said, I do what I do because my job is to raise the next generation of global leaders. That's why I'm in Tokyo. That's why I formed a new community. That's why I teach, which is a new love for me. So this is, this is why I do what I do. And so that's the second question. So the first question, if we were all face to face, I would ask you to yell out, what was that first question? So I'll do it for you. Who am I? That's the first question. The second question, why do I do what I do? And are you ready? Now we're moving to the third question. Last 10 minutes. This is the third question. Ready? What would I attempt to do 
if I knew I could not fail? What would I attempt to do if I knew I could not fail? As a Latina, I was terrified of failing. At Harvard, I was terrified of failing. As I worked on my PhD, I was terrified of not being able to finish my dissertation. I met students who had been in the doctoral program 10 years, which was the limit. And there I was thinking, I need, I need to finish. Fear is what got me across the finish line. It wasn't that I was smarter or better or more organized. It was, it was straight up fear, fear of failing. And I carry that burden in other arenas. Sometimes as a Latina, I'm seen as someone who represents my whole population. And so I feel this burden that I can't do anything wrong because others will then judge Latinos based on who I am. Or I worry that I represent women as the first female dean and the first non-Japanese dean at my university. Everyone was watching what I ate, how I walked, how I dressed, how I, how I showed up in meetings, it was incredible to have that much focus. And it wasn't necessarily encouraging. It was like, it was like being under a microscope. And so as leaders, you will be watched. As leaders, others are hoping that not only will you be a role model, but they're looking for your mistakes. They're looking for you to fail, I would suggest to you. And so over the course of my own practice of leadership, I've asked myself, can I stretch? Can I stretch to, to in fact begin to pave a new path, a new path for social justice, a new path to contribute to that greater good, to a vision. And all of a sudden I ran into this mountain called power. I ran into this concept of, wow, some people have power. I don't have power. I'm not sure that I can make any difference in the world. I began to understand the concept of privilege. Same questions. Wow, some people have more privilege. Some individuals have less. And it was only by making the invisible visible that I began to understand that if in fact I'm going to stretch myself to attempt to do something bigger than I would have imagined, I have to be able to step into that space and ask the questions, what is my relationship to power? Do I fear it? Do I covet it? Do I avoid it? Do I pretend I don't have any? Because I'm gonna say right now, every single one of us, has power. Every single one of us is in a position to either hold on to that power or to share that power. Power by itself is not positive or negative. And I love that Adam Kahane has written a whole book on power and love and leadership. It is not positive or negative. It's your intention and purpose behind the use of your power is it for you alone or is it in the benefit of others? So what would you do if, what would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? Power is connected to love. It's the other side of the same coin. Today, I show up embracing my power. Today, I believe that when I share my power, I'm not diminishing who I am. But as a leader, in fact, it's growing exponentially when my students recognize their own power. And that power often is their voice. That power comes through their purpose and their intention. That power is couched in all of their superpowers. Leadership for social change will require that we look at what would we attempt to do if we knew we could not fail? What is that balance of power and love? What would we, and I would say to you here is that I used to say, well, part of my journey as a leader is that if I see a mountain, I'm not gonna let it sway me. I'm gonna climb that mountain. 
then I got a little smarter, a little wiser. I finished my, my undergraduate degree. I got my first professional job. And then I thought, not only am I going to climb mountains, but you know, there's smarter ways to get to the other side. So I learned, okay, I could go around the mountain. I could go under the mountain. I could bring others along and together we could climb that mountain and support one another. Today, I would suggest to you, I'm moving mountains. I am not just climbing them. And if we think about leadership for social change, if we begin to think about a new renaissance of leadership, it's going to require that we move mountains. Change will require that we own all of these facets of our complexity in order to be able to step into space. So as a Latina, I'm not here to give you the checklist of how Latinas think, but I am here to say as a Latina, I have been shaped by my humble beginnings. I have been shaped by going through an experience of being invisible. When I went to Harvard, tuition at Harvard was more than my family lived on for a year. To be able to stand in that space of what was familiar, which was my cultural narrative, and to bridge and stretch out to a new, a new frontier. That has been leadership development in my life. So as we embark on this leadership renaissance together, and I need you, I need you to be able to step into your power, into your space, into your voice as a leader. I would suggest three steps. We need to step in. It's not a spectator sport. We need to participate. We need to connect to one another. I am not where I am on my own. I stand on the shoulders of many, many individuals. I stand on the shoulders of my parents. As Mexican immigrants, they had no idea what would be possible. They just understood a better life was what was needed. I stand on the shoulders of my mentors who have given me a vision for peace, a vision for social change and transformation. And my students don't know it, but I stand on their shoulders because without them, I would not become the human being I am becoming. And even at the age of 61, I'd like to say I'm still evolving. I'm still evolving. So we're never too old and we're never too young to step into the space of leadership. And I have just a couple of minutes before I want to hear your questions. And so I'm just going to share um, a couple of summary slides of what we've been talking about. And that's not the one I wanna share yet. Okay, so leadership for social change from a Latina perspective, what does it look like? Well, we begin with the first question, who am I? And just a reminder, it connects to your cultural narrative. It connects to your place of being whole, your community. So this is me at six months of age, sitting on my father's lap in the labor camp of Corcoran in the San Joaquin Valley in California. And then my new avatar, and I love that they had an Indian uh, outfit that I could put on. So that is, that is who, who I am. I continue to evolve. Why do I do what I do? I do what I do because my job today is to raise the next generation of global leaders. Now that I'm teaching on Zoom, I've had to really ask the question, how can I build community? And so we decided for one of my leadership seminars that we would choose a theme every week that would connect to leadership. The theme from this photo was Disney, Disney characters. And I thought, oh my goodness, one, I don't have a costume. And then what Disney character symbolizes leadership for me? And that's me in the upper left-hand corner. I decided to go as the Mad Hatter because the Mad Hatter and Alice in Wonderland ran around asking questions that did not have answers. And I think my students believe that that's my purpose in life. And then what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Well, fear is present, fear is present, but I've learned that 
I want to dance with fear. I don't want it to paralyze me. I don't want to be like this figure in this cartoon, absolutely immobile. But by embracing my own power and connecting it to love, the love that I have for you, the love that I have for making a better world, that's how I end up being here with you today. So with that, I will come back and just say thank you so much for listening and would love to hear, um, trying to figure out how to stop sharing. All right, <laughs> sorry for that pause there, but there. All right, so with that, I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for listening and it sounds like maybe you didn't see all three all three slides. I don't know. It, I think it was uh, we. You could see the slides that just weren't highlighted where we could see them extremely well. But oh, sorry about that. I'm so sorry. I thought I had anyway. Technology, technology. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Wahardo, I knew this was going to be amazing, but you <laughs> knocked it out of the park. Um, so I really appreciate. Uh, what you've had to share. But um, now we're going to open up the Q&A for anybody that may have questions. Um, I know we have a few, but if you would like to submit a question, um, you can use the Q&A feature and we'll um, kind of ask them that way. Uh, but here we have a question that says, uh, sometimes I'm not sure I want to share my voice. How can I or we get the courage to do so? We need to practice. We need to practice. And what I would suggest to you is that we can start practicing today. We need to practice in small ways. Let me share a quick story. I was in Japan and I was at Soka University and I don't speak Japanese and everyone speaks Japanese. I'm in a Japanese speaking environment. And I felt like I was in a bubble and no one could see me. So I, I decided I need to take matters into my own hands. So I decided that the elevators would be my training ground. So I would step into an elevator, a student would be there, Japanese student, I didn't know them, they didn't know me, and I would be Miss Chatty Cathy and I'd say, good morning, my name's Maria, how are you? And they'd look at me as if I were some alien out of the swamp, like, oh my God, who is this and why is she talking to me? But because I started doing that, I broke out of my own bubble of silence. And there was nothing easy about that. I've gone into boardrooms where I am the only person of color on the children's hospital board and there are 50 people in the room and they're all white. And I have to ask myself, how do I share my voice here? And what I would suggest to you is that even my presence in that boardroom changed the tone and tenor of the room. Perhaps certain things weren't said because I was there, or perhaps certain things were said because I was there. And so, yes, it's not easy to share your voice, but I would encourage you begin to practice in small ways. When someone says, hi, how are you? Don't just give the pat answer of, oh, I'm fine. Everything's good. Take that as an opportunity, share one thing about yourself. So yesterday someone asked me, hi, you must be really busy. And I said, yep, actually I'm going to speak to Georgia Southern University tomorrow. And, and I went on and on, right? I take every opportunity to open that window. So go to the chat room, tell me one thing, one thing that you would share with someone. You have to practice. And so we need to be able to find safe spaces to be able to share so that when the difficult space emerges, we have, we've had practice, but we also begin to have courage to say what needs to be said. So here's another question uh, that somewhat kind of connects to the last one, but what is your advice for me as a leader who feels overshadowed by others? I think that it begins with us individually beginning to name our superpowers. And I know that sort of, when I said superpower, John smiled. I could see your, your face, John, I saw you smile, right? I know that this idea of superpowers is almost a bit silly. It's, but guess what? In other fields, we call it 
talents, strengths, aptitudes, competencies, call it what you want to call it, but I think it's important that we begin to be able to, to name what it is that makes us unique and then to be able to, to, again, practice sharing it. Yes, others may have more experience, more age, more, more authority. We also have to step into that space. Leadership is not for the, the weak and timid, let me tell you. It's not for those that are squeamish. If everyone could be a leader, while everyone has the potential, not everyone wants to step into that space. I call it reluctant leadership. When I first was identified as a leader at a very young age, I thought, oh no, they're wrong. They must have mistaken me for someone else. I felt that there were 20 of us lined up shoulder to shoulder and someone, a big voice said, could all the leaders please step forward? And I just stood still because I, I couldn't identify with the term. And much to my horror, everyone took a step back and I was left standing in front. So I had to begin to own, what does it mean to be a leader in my own way? So when you're being overshadowed, come back to you, to your purpose, your intention, because no one can take that from you. Thank you. So here's a question, is leadership possible if I feel disconnected from my culture? Leadership will be strengthened when you are able, when each one of us is able to connect to those shaping influences in our life. In the leadership field, we call those crucibles, those crucible moments, those shaping moments when you're forged by fire or some challenge. I would suggest to you that so much of culture especially in the dominant society, is the culture of the majority. But if we begin to unpack that, and I think sometimes the best way is to unpack it by being in conversation with someone who is different than you. And to ask things like, I just asked this question, if you could eat one food for three days, what food would that be? One food for three days, what food would that be? Guess what? There were food items that were shared by my students I, I hadn't even heard of, right? So we, we may feel disconnected, but it's, it's a process of discovery. And the first step is setting your intention to want to discover. Your cultural narrative is there. It just needs to be uncovered and it's not going to look like mine. Mine is a cultural narrative more similar to an immigrant narrative. My son's narrative is going to be different than mine. So thank you for that question. I think it's really important. So here's another question. You chose to move to Japan. What made you want to move there? And is it important where we choose to live? I did make the decision to move to Japan, but it was never on my bucket list. I did not have an aspiration to someday work in a university in a foreign country. I didn't even have the aspiration to work in a foreign country. I love to travel. So travel was there. What I was open to was discovering the next platform where I could contribute to the greater good. That was my quest. Where, where do I need to land next? And the opportunity to launch a brand new faculty. That's why I was brought to Japan. A brand new department was going to open up the Faculty of International Liberal Arts. In a Japanese university, this department will be delivered all in English. So it was an opportunity to recruit faculty members from around the world, set a new curriculum, new admission standards, and then to welcome the first group of students to make travel abroad mandatory, to make the learning of a second or third language mandatory. I mean, all of this just spoke to my spirit of what I believed could benefit the world. And so, yes, I did come to Japan. Um, 
<clears throat> and I think the second half of that question was, how do we decide? How do we choose? I, I don't think it's, go ahead, John. It was, uh, is it important where we, uh, where we choose to live? I think it's important to find your purpose where you are right now. Because in a year, you may be in a different place, even within the same city, but with a different community or in a different state. So I would encourage you to find purpose where you are right now. And then be open to where that purpose takes you. Sorry, lots of questions. We, we, we probably won't have time to get to all of them, but uh, here's I'll another sure. one. Uh, how do I combat discouragement from uh, systematic forces? Sometimes I am inspired and prepared to step up and speak for my community, but can be quickly discouraged by those who refuse to listen or understand or perpetually engage in microaggressions, enabling the very things that oppress minorities. So the question, how do I combat discouragement from those forces? I love that question. Someone up and my response was yesterday. So discouragement comes often and it comes because you are on a mission. You are on a path to change, to contribute to change, to create good. And there are going to be those forces. I mean, change, there's nothing easy about change, even positive change. There's nothing easy about it. And so, yes, I am often faced with resistance from the outside. Uh, microaggressions, I experienced just as much, if not more, discrimination in Japan than I did in the United States as a woman and a woman of color. Uh, imagine being on a train and no one sits next to you because of how you look. It happens to me in Japan every day. So the discur I, all of those are microaggressions that wear you down, right? I heard microaggressions is death by a thousand cuts. So the question then is how do we not only survive but thrive in that atmosphere of discouragement and i think it comes back to that to those three questions who are you what do you understand to be about why do you do what you do that is your compass that is is the direction that you go in doesn't mean that the resistors and the haters aren't going to be around but we learn we learn how to step into a space because we have something to say and we have a larger mission. We're advocating for others, not just ourselves. Thank you for that question. So here's a question from Ariella. As a Latina, your words inspire me to share my background and my story. Do you have any tips on how not to get as nervous when trying to speak to a large group of people? I love that question. So you may not believe me, Ariella, but I was the kind of student who would never speak in class, even when I knew the answer and my professor called on me, my hands would start sweating, my voice would start shaking. I was not a public speaker. If anything, I would hide. I would, I would do what my students do, put your head down, hope that nobody sees you, even though you're right there and I see you. So how do we get past that? I think it's little by little. It's little by little. It's, it's recognizing that, Amelia, I want to hear your story. And we have to practice telling our story. We have to absolutely believe that our story is a superpower. And that the more I can share, you know, when I came on to our webinar today, my goal was not to touch every single person on participating today. I'll tell you what my goal was. My goal was to touch one person, because if my voice, if my words can encourage one person today to stay in there, to take a step, to fight the good fight, then I have no idea where that one human being will go, but I know that I was able to support you. 
So I don't imagine speaking to however 53 people that are on the call today. I don't imagine. I imagine one person and saying, we can do this. We can do this. You can do this. Thank you. So last one, and I think this is one that uh, can be beneficial for many, but um, how do you go about finding mentors was the question. Um, and so how did you go about finding mentors, but then for them, how can they go about finding mentors? I think it's very important to learn from others. And sometimes your mentors are your same age. They just have had different experiences that you can learn from. I often joke that my son, oh my gosh, is, is one of my biggest teachers. There is no one else that can humble me quicker than a 23 year old that says, you're not a professor, you're just my mom. And when is lunch, right? I mean, it's just incredible where our teachers emerge from. I think finding role models is looking for inspiration and learning and sometimes it's someone that we can actually physically connect to, but sometimes it's just seeking out where their voice has been shared, where their voice has been shared. So one of my mentors is Daisaku Ikeda, a world peace um, leader. And while I may not have physical contact with him, there's enough writing that I can gather inspiration from this peace leader. And so I would encourage you and have the courage to step up to someone that you want to connect to. And maybe it's not formally as a mentor, but just say, would you give me a half hour? I just want to hear your narrative. I want to hear what forces have shaped you into becoming who you are. Approach others with that sense of curiosity. And that opens the window for you to practice then sharing who you are. Your story is my story, no matter how diverse we are, because your story captures your essence, your superpowers, and your vision and purpose for leadership. Leadership for social change from a Latina perspective is actually leadership for social change from your perspective. Let's keep moving forward. So let's step in let's connect and let's co-create leadership for social change thank you so much that was great and uh I, for all of you joining us tonight i have uh, dropped a quick evaluation in the the chat that you can click on that link and uh, complete a, a brief evaluation for us um maria thank you again for joining us and sharing uh this this message i, I know that uh those that were here um have learned a lot about you and hopefully uh, how they can go out and lead social change for themselves and our communities. Um, so for everybody that has joined us, um, that's the, the conclusion of this event. Um, have a great uh, rest of your evening or day if it is uh, those of you who are joining us from Japan. And uh, I thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>